Thank you. Hi, I'm Chrissy. I'm an addict. Hi, Chrissy. Thank you, David. Thank you. It was lovely. As usual, in most meetings, I identify with everything. Mostly. Um, I'm another outsider who I came in I came into this fellowship looking for a way to handle my drugs that's what I was looking for and uh, also I was looking to manage parts of my life, i.e. not go to prison. I would got, uh, the end of my using took me to a point where I had a, um, I was threatened with a, a five-year sentence. And I was so lost within myself, I didn't know who I was. I would change who I was depending on who I was with. And my nightmare at, at um, at 16 or 18 when kind of some of the people that I grew up with or were at school with had, had a party with their friends. That was just the worst possible idea because I was such, so split. I didn't know, I called myself different names. I spoke in different ways. I was completely lost. And I just wanted you to like me. And I thought that the way to do that was to make myself the same as you. And of course, if you put all those people, and I've been different people all together in the same room, something's going to go wrong. Someone's going to realize that actually, if you spoke, oh, yeah. And um, yeah, so my, my, um, my fear of being somewhere where I couldn't get away from people, like, you know, in prison, or that kind of environment was just my idea of a nightmare. So I thought, well, I'll just go to NA, which will help me handle my drugs for a while. And, of course, it didn't work. It didn't work. I went to, NA me I went to some NA meetings, and I sat at the back. I came late, left early. Um... I'd put a button in the pot once. I was so embarrassed about not, you know, I didn't want to put any of my money in the pot. What for? But I took a button off because I wanted to be the same as other people. So I wanted to, anyway. And um, I've been treasurer at a few meetings. I've never found any buttons in the pot. <laughs> Some foreign coins, yeah, but not buttons. Um, and it took me a while. I came to, came to meetings for... In fact, it was about a month. Came to meetings for about a month. Used in the toilets. Left early. Wouldn't look at people. One meeting I sat in, my stomach was rumbling so loudly because I didn't eat. Someone turned around and handed me a Mars bar. And I remember I was too embarrassed to eat it. I was starving. But I was just so self-conscious, so full of self-centred fear. Just totally terrified that other people would think something about me. And after about three weeks of going to these meetings, um, I, had a, I landed up my last time of using. It took me to a place, another squat, another uh, being with people that I didn't want to be with. Um, using against my will, landing up seriously, seriously considering suicide. Uh, and this little thought occurred to me. I could try one more of those meetings. I don't think that thought was in me. It was surrender, actually. That's what happened. I used to see a sign on... There was a, a slogan on the wall at Rathbone Place lunchtime meeting that said, I didn't quit, I surrendered. And that's what happened to me that day. I, this thought came to me that 
perhaps I didn't need to kill myself just there and then. I'll try one more of those meetings. And I went to a meeting and I heard this woman. She was American and she was four years clean. And I remember thinking, my God. It was the first time I'd ever listened to anyone. I'd been at meetings, but I hadn't actually opened my ears. And this woman, I remember looking at her thinking, God, if she can do four years, I'll try four hours. And it was three o'clock in the afternoon. And what I did that was different was when people said to me at the end of the meeting, will you come for a cup of tea afterwards? I said, yes. Every bone in my body wanted to just run and hide and use more. Because that's what I'd always done. Just use. Every feeling I had, I was terrified of. Didn't know how to handle anything. And what I landed up doing was going for a cup of tea with people after the meeting and going through the feelings. And I started to learn that initial thing of there is no way round feelings without drugs. You can't go under them, over them, round them. You've got to go through them. And that actually it felt difficult. It felt really, well, more than difficult, it really hurt. I sat there feeling like a frightened rabbit in headlamps. But other people were kind and didn't give me the third degree. And I started going to the same lunchtime meeting every day. And after a couple of weeks, people went, oh, hi, Chrissy," And seemed reasonably pleased to see me, rather than opening the door on the security chain, going, you again, no way, and slamming the door in my face, which is what I was used to from my using. And... I started to feel, and people remembered my name. That was so important. I'd felt so invisible. Really, a lot of my, my I grew up in a family that was, I shouldn't say put the, put the dis in dysfunctional. Um, like a lot of families that a lot of us come from, it was pretty messed up. And um, I felt like I didn't matter. That was the message that I got. And I didn't have a voice. I didn't have, I didn't know what I had to do, who I had to be to get my needs met. And so I would just hide everything, hide everything about me, and really, and, and hide away. And using drugs for me was a way of hiding, hiding from my feelings, hiding from you, hiding who I really was. And what's happened for me in NA is that I've gone from someone who felt like a jelly. I felt like a jelly, with, or like an egg with no shell. You know when you softly boil an egg and you take the peel off it? I felt like that for ages. And that if you just sort of push me too hard, I'd break and run all over the place. But I stayed because I had nowhere else to go and because... I've got some hope. I saw some people and I thought, if they can do it for that long, I can do it for this long. And someone turned around to me and they said, you know, if you've got a day clean, you've got something to offer someone who's just walked in the door. I was like, really? Are you sure? Me? No. That actually, if I'd... I'd never had something to offer anyone. I'd never had the ability to turn around to someone and say, I've been clean for 24 hours, and for someone else to turn around to go, wow, really? I'd never been able to give anyone any hope. And that was the first gift that I got, really, that actually I could make a difference to someone else. Someone turned around to me early on and said, I believe in you and your ability to stay clean and recover in NA. You know that thing in Just for Today. Whether they believed, really believed it or not, it doesn't matter. It gave me hope. I believed that they believed in me. And I believe that no one's past, no one's helpless, no, one, no one's hopeless, no one is without a chance, whatever goes on. I had a lot of reservations, like you were saying, David, a lot of um, things about what if. I limited myself with things that I would imagine might happen. 
and things that I would surely have to use if they happened. And I would spend ages thinking about all the awful things that might happen about which I'd have to use. And other people would say, well, can't blame her, really. You know, this terrible thing happened. And so part of me would be sort of going, well, then I'd, I'd it'd be like a free use-up. No one would blame me. They'd say, well, you know, you'd have to. And I have had a lot of really difficult stuff happen, stuff that if I'd have been told early on, this might happen. I would have not going to get through that. But actually what's happened is that each time something difficult's happened, the fellowship's been there for me. I've landed up going to meetings, crying my eyes out, and saying yes when people said, do you want to come, you know, come to my... People have made me a bed on their sofa, made me a sandwich, run me a bath and took me to meetings until I was able to do that for myself again. And that's happened for me time and time again. At the end of relationships, through loss, my best friend died when I was 10 years clean of AIDS. A lot, a lot of my friends died. Um, most of the people that I used with are dead. Very few of us survived that, you know, that time of the, the 80s. Um, my daughter was still born, seven and, a, seven and a half months. My son was diagnosed with autism. Um, all that, a lot of that stuff happened all at once. In a period, some of some of it happened in a period of a couple of months. And uh, people say God doesn't give give you more than you can handle. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Really not sure about that. But what I do know is that when the shit hits the fan for me, I go back to basics. I do what I did when I first got clean. I go to a lot of meetings and I open my mouth and I get real. And I say yes and accept whatever help. And I spend my time with other people who are clean and recovering, and who have faith in me and my ability to recover. That works more than anything else. That's the language of the heart. When they talk about when two addicts in recovery shed the heart of NA beats, that thing when I'm sharing from my heart, when I let people know that actually I'm not okay, I'm hurting, and they just look at me and say, yeah, it's okay. You'll be okay. There's nothing quite like that feeling of connection where I let people know that I'm not as together today as, you know, as I was. Or I may have been telling you for the last X amount of time I'm fine. And then it's like, actually, I get real. I've never, ever been met by anything but compassion and acceptance and love. And I don't, I've never found that outside of these rooms. I have got friends who aren't in recovery. Not that many. Because um, the quality of my friendships amongst people in NA is unlike anything I've found anywhere else. Um, the intimacy, that intimacy you see, to allow people to see who I really am, that I'm not. I had. Uh, I had a lot of stuff where I would look at other people and say, "Well, that's what that's what people would be would be like when they're thirty years clean. They'll be together. They'll be I don't know. They'll be confident. They'll never have fear. They'll never have." And do I measure up? Not internally. Externally, yeah. But when I can tell people what goes on inside, that actually there's fear, there's difficult stuff. I've had some stuff in the last year to do with my family. That had, I was estranged from a lot of my family for for a while. I needed to be. It was part of part of my process. And um, some stuff's happened in the last year that's been really challenging. 
that word that we use, challenging. It's been really painful. It's been really difficult. Uh, and it's landed up with something remarkable happening. By taking a step back and allowing a process to happen, I don't quite know what happened. I do know it didn't come from me. I do know that it was from, I don't know, a better part of me that I often don't recognize and don't connect with. There, I've found a point of a different relationship with my mother of forgiveness, which to let go of my, my expectations, to let go of the hurt that she wasn't what I wanted her to be. She didn't give me what I needed. Um, and that, that it's nothing to do with me. Her stuff is her inability to be nurturing, to be whatever, is because she's one of us. And it's nothing to do with me. And something, her husband, her fifth husband, died earlier this year. And um, something happened. I went to his funeral and something happened from a... There was like a breaking of this shell of disappointment and anger and hurt that she was who she was. Just seeing her as a vulnerable, elderly, frail, old lady... And actually, I felt nothing but compassion for. And that was something I've never felt before. And to be able to forgive her for not being what I wanted her to be has been a huge thing. And it's opened up something where I've been able to feel more forgiving towards some other people who've not been, not done what I wanted them to do, not done what I expected them to do, where I felt hurt and let down and disappointed. And that feels like freedom. When they talk about a bridge to normal living, I'm not sure about that, but there's, I don't know what normal living would be or whether I'd want it if I got there. But freedom, I've got freedom to keep changing, to keep, to keep expanding. I it's like I limit myself. In, I've limited myself in recovery time and time again, going, OK, right, I want... You know, I wanted to move out of London to... Um, I'm a Londoner, and I wanted to move out of London and go and, go and live um, in the countryside. And I moved to this village, and I was imagining how lovely and friendly it was going to be living in a, living in a village and um, you know, how I might bake cakes and stuff and how I was going to feel part of. I've been there 25 years and I still don't feel part of. Well, fancy that. I keep coming back here. I went, to, I joined... Um, joined a village committee that, 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 and I realised how much I take for granted in NA committees how we behave towards each other is remarkable that actually we let each other speak we treat each other with respect we take turns whatever. I joined this village committee and felt alternately suicidal and homicidal I had to ring my sponsor after every single committee I think I lasted three months and made excuses and said I couldn't do it anymore. NA committees have taught me more about myself than I'd really like to know, actually. What a control freak I am. I came in this sort of, oh, no, I won't say anything. Oh, by the way, you shouldn't do it like that. Give me half a chance. I'll take it. But the gift I get is being able to laugh at myself. I About... That, okay. The, my son, when he was diagnosed um, as having an autistic spectrum disorder, the um, educational psychologists and stuff were saying, we don't think he'll manage mainstream school. I think you should send him to this special school. And we didn't, we didn't agree. 
and we fought. Being in recovery has given me the ability to fight for what I believe in and to be assertive and to be a pain in the ass, to be difficult, to not care what other people think in, in that kind of situation. I can fight for someone else. And he had a really rough, really rough ride. But they were saying, we don't think he'll, we don't think he'll cope. He needs to go to this, this other school. And, and we pushed and we fought and we were a pain in the ass. And you know when professionals say, hmm, you're very well informed, aren't you? <laughs> in that kind of, God, you're just difficult. <laughs> um, but he's now 24. And he went travelling around the world. He got to 16. He went travelling around the world. He, at one point, he, he told us this, he'd been carrying this secret around. And he told us this, this thing about himself. And um, it was a big deal for him. And a couple of weeks later, he said, do you want to ask me anything about what I told you? And I said, yeah, were you worried about telling us? He said, why would I be worried with your checkered past and all your funny friends? <laughs> and the joy of actually... The gift of being able to bring up kids within this fellowship, <clears throat> within the safety of the friends, the... the the fellowship. There's two parts. There's the program. There's working the steps. There's the stuff I do with my sponsor. There's being in meetings. And there's fellowship. There's hanging out in McDonald's after the meeting. There's, you know, there's one of my home group members there. Um, there's, you know, I don't go there for the, for the food, honestly. Um, <laughs> I'm a food snob. Um, so she, at midnight last night in Soho looking for ice cream. You know, I love being able to be impulsive, spontaneous, and silly. To actually have the childhood at 55 that I didn't have at 5, at 10, at 15. To be able to laugh and be stupid. My voice aches. My throat hurts this morning from laughing. Normally I spend time at conventions laughing. Being with people I love being with, who I can be silly with, who I can be, and who I can be serious with too. And the thing about getting older in recovery is years ago at that All Real Place meeting in Hampstead, up the road from the Hampstead Heroes, there were bicycle racks outside with tons and tons of bikes, bicycles. And someone said, if we keep coming back, one day, instead of there being bicycles, there'll be Zimmer frames. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, and then what will we do? So one day, I'd like to have an NA old people's home. Because <laughs> I don't want to be locked away in some retirement home uh, where I have to say no to the glass of sherry at six o'clock every night. I want to be with people I can be stupid with. I can be myself, who I like being with. And in fact, yeah, we have a plan. Maybe we could have a, like, lots of, Mary has an idea that we could have, diff we could have, re we could have retirement homes in different countries, so that if we got a resentment, we could then do a timeshare, you know. <laughs> go somewhere else for a while. But actually, why not? You know, the possibilities are limitless. But the thing is about being connected. I, when I feel connected, I feel whole. I feel safe. I feel solid. I feel not like a jelly. I feel like I can stand tall, look people in the eye, and say, I'm OK. Just that I'm, I love and accept myself just the way I am. Um, I can accept myself as being me, a bit silly, a bit, and I can accept you. And the more I can accept you, the more I can accept me, the more I know it's not just me.
the more I hear other people, I was 30 years clean in November. Um, And for a while I go, well, I'm not what I thought 30 years clean would be. I don't know. I thought somehow something, I don't know, maybe I'm not what I thought I'd be. But actually, I've got freedom. There's nothing that need limit me. Uh, thank you. About six years ago, my son left, went traveling, went to university, now doing a second degree. Blah, it's amazing for the kid that wasn't going to manage mainstream doing pretty damn well. Um, he's really proud of the fact that we're in recovery. He was at university. He said he was playing. He, there was a girl in his class who, was, who said her parents were in another fellowship. And, uh, and he said, oh, yeah, they're in, you know, whatever, the mother fellowship. And, um, and he said, and I told them about you. And I said, really? Are you proud of the fact that we're in recovery? And he said, oh, my God, yeah. He said, yeah, you have a life <coughs> way beyond what all my, all my, none of my friends have parents like you. It's like, wow, really? <laughs> I think that was a good thing. <coughs> um, I stay. I've, because I've never been sorry I've gone to a meeting. I've never... When I've made the effort, I've never regretted it. Very often what happens is that I feel that connection with someone that makes me think that's why I stay. That language of the heart, that I can see into you and feel nothing but love. And I can accept that perhaps you might feel some of that for me and I'm in with a chance. And I keep finding new passions. I, oh yeah, so my son left home, I was left with an empty nest. What the hell am I gonna do? And I did consider, I don't spend much time in, in, um, in my village. Um, my village is here. This is my village. Um, I come to London a lot. I come. I make an effort to go to meetings. I put a lot of effort into getting my drugs. I was told early on, if you put some of that effort into getting to meetings, you'll be fine. I still do. I hammer up and down the motorway a lot. It's fine. Um, I feel really lucky that I can. I can, you know, come and connect. Um, where was I going? Can't remember. Oh yeah. So I was really lost, and I had some time about six years ago of going, what do I want? Is this all there is? Is this all there is to my life? I was really, I hadn't realized how much of my effort I'd put into this boy that needed lots of help. I hadn't realized how much of myself had just got involved in micromanaging his life. And, oh, I micromanage anyone else's life, given half a chance to. <laughs> And I felt really, you know, really lost. What am I going to do? What? And I started to consider, maybe I could be normal. Maybe I could, maybe I could just drink red wine. And I started to think about how big would the glass have to be? Have to be really big. And actually, there's nothing about my thinking or behaviour. I can't eat you know, Maltesers in a normal way. Sometimes my, my husband will buy me a box of Maltesers, knowing that I really like Maltesers, and I go, oh, God, not a whole box, because when I eat chocolate, I get migraine. But if I only eat a few, it's all right. Well, they talk to me. They talk to me from the cupboard. I go, I'll just have half a dozen. I'll just put them in a little white porcelain bowl and eat them one at a time. Stuff them all in my mouth. I go, next time, I'll just have some more and I'll try and just eat them really slowly. <laughs> and by the end of the night, guess what? So there's nothing about my behavior or my thinking that suggests that I could do a little nice glass of something 
forget it. It's just not going to happen yet. You know, maybe next year. Not today. Just for today. No. So I went to college. At 49 years old, I went to college. I was the oldest girl in the class. And I trained to do something that I love. I found something new. I found a passion. I, joined a com I went to an H&I committee to complain about how long it was taking for the letter that I, I was writing to. I was involved in prison sponsorship. And it was taking about a month for a letter from a woman I was sponsoring in Holloway to get to me. And I went to complain. Why is it taking so long? How long does it take to stick a letter in an envelope and post it to me? And they said, actually, we're desperate for people to come and help. You could come and stick the letters in the envelope. And I went, oh, OK. All right, then. And I got involved in this committee where I started reading when people write in and ask for a sponsor from prison, they often write a little bit about themselves. One guy wrote, thank you for, he got a basic text which you can get free. Any prisoner can get a basic text free if they ask. Just a basic text, not the other literature. Don't tell them they can write in for the rest of it. But, so this man wrote back and he said, thank you for, um, I've got the basic text. It's my most treasured possession in prison. I thought, wow. And I read letters from people saying, I've been in NA before. I had, you know, 17 years, seven years, 20, whatever time. And now I'm back in prison. And it reminds me. It's like, yeah, that's waiting out there for me. I go to meetings, I hear newcomers, and I'm so grateful. Because I remember. I need to remember, like you said, I need to remember how I felt. I need to remember why I'm here. I'm here because of that, and I'm here because of this. I'm here because I love doing this. It's a huge privilege that actually I found a seat and I've stayed where so many don't. And it's important, my job is to reach out. If I see someone new in a meeting, it's really important that I let go of my self-consciousness or I don't know what to say or my, you know, feelings of, uh, yeah. How do you start a conversation with someone? Except you go and give it a, give it a shot. Hi, are you new? Welcome. Do you want to go for a cup of tea? That's my job. Make an effort, even if it's not easy. And from that, I've got the most beautiful people in my life, people I really like spending time with, and who love and accept me in spite of everything. And that's, um, oh, I'll shut up. Thank you. Aww.